Sean from Club Fed just did a video on sentencing day. What you need to know, what you can ask the judge for when you get sentenced. Watch the video. Thanks. Hi, this is Sean with Club Fed True Stories. This video is all about sentencing day. And boy, that's a big day. Anybody that's going to get sentenced to prison, your sentencing day, it's finally here. So I'm here to talk about federal prison sentencing. Uh, this video is more or less for people that are looking at 15 years or less, which means you're going to a camp or a low if you're a non-violent criminal. Um, so all you know about all the white collar crimes, they consider that nonviolent. But drug dealers, drug transportation people, like your truck driver, and you put an extra box in your truck, you know, and take it across state lines, you're still considered a nonviolent criminal. Um, half the people at the camp I was at were were drug dealers, or they were just transporting drugs. So I did a 52 month sentence in Florence, Colorado prison camp in Colorado. I'm from San Francisco area, uh, but I picked where I wanted to go, and I'll get to that. Why Why did I pick to go to Colorado? Because they had RDAP. And uh, so there's a few things I'm going to tell you at the end of this video that after you get sentenced, you want to ask your judge for. You want to request these things. So let me start out with, with my case, and maybe some questions will be answered for you. So I did a fi I got 52 months for wire fraud. I was doing tax returns for homeless people and drug addicts, got them all big fat refunds. Now I owe the government $1.7 million. They want all the refunds back. Uh, I took a 20% cut out of the refunds I got for people when I had people working with me and co-defendants and all that. Uh, so our co-conspirators. But I was the leader, so they wanted to make sure I got sentenced last and I got more time than anybody else. And that took four years of pretrial, four years of living hell. Uh, so when my sentencing day came, it was the biggest relief ever. Even if they would have given me 20 years, it's over. I know what I'm facing. So if you're on pretrial, if you've been indicted, uh, maybe your office got raided, your house got raided, like mine, my house got raided. There was 30 black SUVs on the block. All the neighbors saw everything, you know, um, and I hadn't even been indicted yet. This is that, that was a year before I got indicted, but that, it all started back in 2012. I got indicted in 2013. I got sentenced in 2017. Uh, did a few years in prison. I got out about a year ago, and I'm talking about the sentencing day. So when my house got raided, the landlord evicted me because... Found out about the 30 black SUVs on the block. Now, these were Treasury agents and IRS agents. Some people get raided by marshals and the FBI. It just depends on what kind of crime you're doing. Uh, it could be DEA agents. Um, but some one of those government authorities are going to come and they're going to raid you. Um, so they froze all my bank accounts. Any money that I was making off my little 20% off the refunds, I was frozen. That was taken. Um, uh, so, uh, my cars got repossessed eventually because I couldn't keep up the car payment and, uh, I had to, you know, I got evicted from the house. I sold the furniture I got, sold, you know, computers. I sold all the things I had out of storage trying to, the, the landlord gave me like, uh, three months. It was the night I fought the eviction. Of course I was going to lose, but so, you know, the last day there, I got nothing to, I had one used car that broke down, figures, you know, get indicted and the car breaks down. I ended up homeless. I ended up homeless, man. And there's another video I did about that. And I didn't, I didn't, I showed up for my first court appearance and they gave me a bond and then I went on the run. You can see my video about on the run. And I ended up turning myself back in eventually because living in a park wasn't cutting it with marshals looking for you and everything else. And, uh, so my four years of pretrial, that was a journey. It was stressful. 
you know, I had a girlfriend at the time. She ran away. You know, she, the, all my friends left. Whatever friends I thought, they were drug addict friends anyway. So they were just <sighs> mental friends, I guess. Um, I got back into recovery and AA and uh, uh, I met some good people during my four years of pretrial in AA. And a bunch of them showed up at my court at my sentencing day and talked to the judge. I'll get to all that. Um, but I want to tell you, when, while you're on pretrial, um, you'll find your people you work with. They find out, you, you know, you're indicted. People just believe that they don't want nothing to do, do with you. They don't talk. For a white-collar criminal, it's a little different than, you know, the guys that go to the penitentiary and you got tattoos all over you and, you know, and they do armed robberies and, and all that kind of crime like that. Well, their lifestyle is a little different. The people, I mean, they got family members going in and out of prison. Um, their neighborhoods are just, I mean, those people kind of understand them. And, and uh, you know, I, the guys that I have known that have been to the penitentiary and all that, their women, their wives, they'll stick with them. A white collar criminal, if you're going to do five years or more, your wife is probably going to leave you. More, more likely than none. I knew one guy that did an eight-year sentence. His wife stuck with him the whole time. He's the only guy I ever heard of whose wife stuck with him. Um, you, you'll be surprised. Um, I've got some family on my side now, on my dad's side, that stuck with me through prison. My mom's side of the family, all those relatives, they don't want nothing to do with me. Still, they don't want nothing to do with me. Um, my friends in recovery... Wrote me letters, put some money on my books, and they were here when I got out of prison, and I got them in my life today. Uh, so, I was holding up the sentencing table. So, these are the federal guidelines for sentencing. Um, I, in my description, if you click the description, I think you got to hit the read more, it'll open up. So, I've got all kinds of free references and links to character reference letters to uh, sentencing table calculators on how much time you're going to get, um, where do you want to go, how to get into RDAP for free, I mean, how to get in, how to get in, yeah, for free, how to get in RDAP, all these things, RDAP can take a year off your sentence, um, there's how to email, a uh, how to email an inmate, how to send letters, how to send money, there's all kinds of links, there's a good site called Prisonology by my friend Walt Pavlo, who has a prison consulting business, Walt Pavlo, uh, I never hired a prison consultant because I didn't have the money, but Walt answered the phone when I called. He had a lot of videos out there, and we became friends over the years, and when I went to prison camp, he put $100 on my books every month while I was in there. Another good prison consultant is RDAP Dan. RDAP Dan put some money on my books. He does these live streams and some of his clients all pitched in put like 50 bucks on my books two or three times and he sent me some money to get my driver's license renewed while I was in prison and get my social security card because you gotta have all that before they'll release you out to a halfway house um, but those are all in my, my videos if you've got some extra money to afford a prison that's sold in RDAP Dan or Walt Pablo do not hire Justin Papperty I don't know, Walton Dan doesn't want to hear me say that. He ripped off eight people that I know of in the camp. Just took their money for two phone calls. And I don't I don't want to get into that, but um, supposedly the guy's got a good reputation. He makes some good videos and some good information out there, but stay away. Um, I used a public defender and a court-appointed lawyer. Um, I had five grand in the beginning that I gave to a lawyer. Um, and, and basically... Uh, they never went to court for me. Um, <laughs> when I house got ready, I had a big 32-inch TV and I had a couple laptops. And the lawyer got those back from me after the investigation was done. Is that worth five grand? Probably not. I'd rather save the money. But um, in my opinion, uh, the court-appointed court appointed attorneys, even the, even the federal public defenders, uh, uh, work for you. When it comes to the feds, you're indicted, you're going to prison. There's a 96.4, um, you know, uh, chance that you're going to, uh, you know, prosecution rate. Um, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, anyways, the feds, the feds got you, they got you. I mean, you can look at all these politicians and 
Trump's friends and all these people with tons of money and everything else, they still go to prison. Uh, unless you can get Trump to give you a pardon, you're, 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 you're going to go to prison. If you're 80 years old, you're going to go to prison. When the feds want you, they want you. And even if you win the case, they'll come back at you a year later with another case. Um, they're they're going to make sure you do your time. You, you, you can't fight the government. You can't fight the feds. If you're going to a if if you're got a state case, yeah, hire hire a lawyer. Uh, look what O.J. Simpson hired lawyers. He won his case. I'm I'm just saying, but you can win the state, but you can't win the government. Um, so my sentencing guidelines. So I finally took a plea deal, and it was for seventy seven to ninety six months, um, which I had these. I had a. Offense level of 24. I don't know if you can see this, but it's in yellow. I had an offense level of 24 points. Uh, but I was category 4. So there's six different categories. And it has to do with your criminal history. So I wasn't a perfect angel. and all. It wasn't my first offense. It was my first time ever going to prison. But I'd been to county jail for little things like a quarter gram of cocaine. Um, you know, had a DUI. Um, another quarter gram of cocaine. I wrote a bad check once while I was on probation for the quarter gram of uh, cocaine. And I've struggled with drugs and alcohol. But, you know, now I, I haven't touched drugs in over four years. I'm in recovery. I live in a clean and sober house. And I'm still on federal probation. I take lots of drug tests. I pass them all. I'm doing the right thing. I'm not breaking any laws. I got two more years left of probation. Um... But these are all things a, a regular a person should be doing anyways. So when it comes to your sentencing day, how, how, how can you talk the judge down? So I violated my pretrial three times I came up with dirty tests. Um, they let me go to two different drug programs. The first drug program they had sent me to was called Newbridge in Berkeley. It was a three-month hardcore, I want to say, attack therapy program. Um, you got no coffee, no cigarettes, no sweets, no phone calls, no mail, no outside world, no contact, no TV, no magazines, no newspapers. You never left the building. One time we left to go take a physical at a hospital. That was it. Um, and I stayed another three months and then I did a year of aftercare with that program. Um, and then I relapsed again. The stress of pretrial. Four years of pretrial, you know, people are telling me, oh, you're not going to go to prison. They don't let you just run around the streets for four years and then they're going to send you to prison. Oh, yes, they do. I just got a call from a lady the other day. I was going through. She got four years of pretrial, too. She finally got sentenced. Um, I, I don't want to say her name, but uh, you know who, who you are. <laughs> and you've got the 30 months. And she, uh, she got into RDAP. And uh, I, I, she called me. We had a really good talk, and I hope she gets through all this. Um, if you're going to a camp or a low, I say in all my videos, you don't have to join a gang or a car, as they call it. There's very little politics. You can talk to anybody you want. You're not going to be anybody's bitch. Don't worry about dropping the soap. Just don't ask nobody to pick it up for you. Um, you know, um, there's some fights. I've never seen anybody get shanked. But you can get beat up for, there's a lot of gambling, a lot of poker tables in there. And, or you see people snitch on people with a cell phone. Um, and those are the two things that get you beat up. So, if you got co-defendants and they want you, whatever deals you make with the, with the feds before you go to court and all that. Whatever you need to uh, <laughs> tell on, do that before you get to, to camp. When you get there, be on a straight and narrow. Keep your mouth shut. Whatever you see people doing, let them do that. Because you can get beat up for that. But back to the sentencing. So I'm looking at 77 to 96 months. But because I did... So the judge told me when I got when I showed up for sentencing, um, I had character reference letters written uh, to the judge. And I have links below. I think there's five or six with templates and sample letters and all that. And all these help. Uh, be careful when you have people write these character reference letters because they don't want to paint you out as an angel. They need to say that, I, you know, I know Sean did the crime. I know he did this. I do believe he's a good man. You know, but 
Um, but the judge gets thousands of these letters every year. I don't even know if the judge really reads through all the letters. But when you write a letter, you know, um, it, it's got to stand out. And it can't be this, the same letter that the judge gets from everybody. Um, anyways, check out the links below. There's a thing called a personal narrative. And that's when you get your chance to talk to the, to speak right before the judge sentences you. You get something to say. So when it came to my term, I, I had a whole personal narrative written, written out and everything. Um, when the judge asked me, what, did I have any last words? I stood there and I said, you know what, Your Honor? I ripped up my, I ripped it up and I said, I had a whole thing written out for you, Your Honor, but um, I'm just going to speak from my heart. And I told the judge, you know, I, did, I know I did what, I, what I did was wrong. I know I ripped off the government and I may have thought I had good intentions in the beginning but through this pretrial and stuff. You know, I, I always knew, I always knew, Your Honor, what I was doing, you know, was not legal. And um, I'm not here to ask you for, you know, probation. I know you got to give me some time. And I just went on and I spoke from the heart. I don't remember the exact words I said, but... Um, the judge told me I was complicated and she says, you know, I see here, you know, you've relapsed a couple times, you've done drug, you know, you used some drugs on pretrial and you went through a couple programs. But what I also did was I went out of my way and I, I volunteered for, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. I worked at their central office. I answered phones. I, you know, I, I, uh, swept the floors. I cleaned the bathrooms. You know, I cleaned the office, I did their paperwork, I made up their AA schedules. Alcoholics call up AA and they want to know where a meeting is, they want help. And I was the guy answering the phone and, and helping people. And uh, I did this like 20 hours a week um, for about a year. I also helped feed the homeless on Friday night. I got involved in this little ministry place thing. we get in the van, about 10 of us, and we'd have jackets and blankets and you know underwear and socks and bag lunches and we just found these homeless tents you know you seen them on these, these blocks full of tents and we pull up and we just went and we gave all these things to the homeless i did that every friday night i probably did that for a couple years um i also uh cooked at a little drug rehab uh kind of well it was kind of like a shelter and a drug rehab place um that uh i knew the guys who ran it and so what i did was for room and board i did it for free but i cooked their lunch and dinner seven days a week and there was about 40 people i had to cook for and uh so you know i, I worked every day and I, and and i did this just just for a place to sleep in, in a room and board um and i had everything documented and uh so when i went to go before the judge the two three people showed up from AA and they spoke to the judge for me and one of the persons was the guy that we used to go feed the homeless with another one was the one who ran that program where I cooked for free and they told the judge all these things I did another friend from AA and he you know he, he they said their piece to the judge and so the judge told me well for everything you've done and the drug programs you've done and I've seen that you turned your life around and you've, you've actually went above and beyond as she says you could do all this just to get a lesser sentence and I know people do this but you've been doing this for a few years now and you've shown me you can change and I haven't even sentenced you yet so there's hope for you Sean so I'm going to take you from category four and I'm going to put you in category one she took two years off my sentence Instead of the 77 months, or I could have got 96 months, I got 52 months. So it's almost cut in half. 96 months and 52 months. That's a big chunk. So, you know, she's probably saved me four years of sentencing. The prosecution was going crazy. They hated it. They were arguing and yelling. And they were yelling at the judge. You can't give him that. You can't do that to him. But she did. So if you do things like that and get it documented, um, you can get some time off your sentence. Um, so, um, what I want to talk about is when you do get sentenced. So I got, uh, you, three things that you definitely want to ask the judge for is 
a recommendation for RDAP if you're a drug addict or an alcoholic. If you never did drugs or alcohol, you don't qualify for RDAP. Please don't lie. You've already done enough because you're going to prison. I'm sorry. I, you know, if you didn't have a drug and alcohol pro problem, um, don't take a bed away from somebody who needs that program, okay? Um, that's just the way it is. What a lot of us did. A lot of us drank. A lot of us, you know, smoked pot, did crystal meth, whatever it was. So you want to ask the judge for a recommendation for RDAP. You also need to have that in the pre-sentence report. And that's another video. Um, now, even though the judge recommends RDAP, that doesn't mean you're going to get it. But it helps. Um, I also want to ask the judge to self-surrender. Because um, they can, they can hand, right after you get sentenced, they can cuff you and take you away. And uh, you'll be put in a federal detention center for months. And then they're going to shackle you and put you on a bus and put you on a con air. And take you to Oklahoma City for another month or two. And you'll be shackled with murderers and everything else. And it's, it's like, a, it's a nightmare. And it could be three, four months before you even get to your destination. So, so ask to self-surrender and, and uh, to the prison. And the last thing is, well, you want to ask for some time. You want, you know, uh, you want to, um, uh, time to get your affairs in order. So they gave me 60 days. I think they give up to 90 days. Um, and then the last thing is you want to ask, where do you want to go? So because I was doing RDAP uh, and I live in California, I knew I was going to a camp. There are no RDAPs in the camps in California, but I knew there was one in Colorado. And I had a friend who lived in Colorado. And I just thought, I'll go stay with my buddy a couple couple days before I turn myself in and I'll, I'll, I'll go to Colorado because I was, it was that or Oregon were the two closest. So you may have to travel a thousand miles away to find a, a, a camp with RDAP or a low with an RDAP. Um, so uh, I asked to go to Florence, Colorado and, and they said that. Um, so my judge was Judge Gonzalez Rogers. It was a lady and I heard she was a medium judge. You got your hard judges, you got your soft judges. I heard she was a medium, um, and I think she was a fair judge. Uh, when I got there, they were just sentencing the guy in front of me, and he, she gave him 10 years. And I remember him say, his lawyer saying, uh, or he said to, judge, to the judge, well, um, didn't I do good in the halfway house? And she said, yeah, you did good in the halfway house. And he said, D aren't you going to consider that? She goes, I did consider that. So this was a guy who, instead of being locked up in a detention center, did his pretrial time in a halfway house. And the pro and it's good and bad. You don't get any credit for the time in the halfway house. If you're locked up in the detention center, you actually get credit time served. But if you're in a halfway house, they don't give you the credit time served. And this guy got 18 months in a halfway house and got no credit time served. And I don't know if the judge said she took it under consideration. But I, I don't know. I mean, she specifically told me she was taking all these years off my sentence for the things she did. So uh, I don't know. If she, was, she was hard on that guy. But when it came to me, and, you know, and I, and I was already a fuck up. But I guess, you know, I, I turned myself around. So... You know, um, I, I just want to say when she told me I had 52 months, it was, ah, all this weight was lifted off my shoulders. I was so relieved to get sentenced. So relieved. So if you're watching this video and you're on pretrial, man, I'm, I'm telling you, pretrial was harder than prison because um, I only went to a camp. So hopefully you're on pretrial and you're going to a camp or a low and you got less than 15 years. Um, and let's hope you get no time at all. I don't want to see anybody go to prison. But use this time, you know, to turn yourself around. Become the person you could, you've always, you've always been able to be. I know there's good in everybody. And, and there's good, and I worked over at the 88 Supermax. And I mean, there's good in the Unabomber. There's good in El Chapo. They'll never see it. They didn't live to get that part of their life. But I mean, I just believe everybody deserves a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance. We're all human. So, um, you know, I, 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 my time in prison, I spent uh, taking all kinds of programs and courses, and, you know, and recovery. And I, I really got a lot out of RDAP. And I did AA in there. Just, you know, use this time in your life if you're on pretrial to turn it around, man. 
turn around, come out the other side, and and be a better person. And um, it, it's it's a learning experience. Um, that's all I can say, you know. Um, so it wasn't that bad at the prison camp. Had a lot of good memories too, a lot of sad memories. And I think I'm gonna wrap it up with that. Um, please subscribe, hit the like button, share this video. Don't forget the description below. Um, leave me a comment. My phone number's on there. You need any advice, questions? You just want to talk to somebody because you know I know what you're going through. If you're if you're going through what I went through on a pre-trial, and you need somebody to talk to, man, just call me. Thanks, guys.